Chen, and I'm director of middle school curriculum for the district. And um, I have my two co-directors are also on. I'll let them introduce themselves as long as our chief academic officer and our board attorney. So Bethany, wanna go? Sure. I am Bethany Quisenberry. I am the director for elementary curriculum and instruction. Welcome and thank you um, for joining and volunteering for this very important uh, board advisory committee. Good evening and happy Monday, everyone. I'm Candace Elevato. I am the director for high school curriculum and instruction. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Jeff Spiro. I'm the chief academic officer for the school district. It's nice seeing everybody and thank you for volunteering your time. And good evening, everybody. This is Kathy Dupree Brino. I'm the school board attorney and I'm here to hopefully guide you a little bit and um, look forward to a great year. And I do know that um, board member Giovanelli is also on with us tonight. I did see. Ms. Giovanelli, do you want to introduce yourself to the group? Hello, good to see everybody, half of everybody. Uh, I look forward to being on this group. I'm excited. This is the first time for me, so um, I can't wait to um, see all the good things that we do. Thank you. And last but not least, our recording secretary, our sweet Helen Hernandez is on, um, and she will be... Um, taking minutes for us and as well just to notify you that we are recording this meeting um, as well. So tonight, um, typically what we do is we go ahead and do our elections, but um, our board attorney. Laura you, Laura, you muted yourself. Thank you. Rookie mistake. So, um, so typically we go ahead and do our elections, but we're gonna hold on that so that our board attorney can do her presentation as she has another meeting to attend as well. So she is going to go over parliamentary procedure and the policy and how we operate for this year. Um, so I'll turn it over to our board attorney. Thank you so much, Lori. So I'm going to share my screen. And can everyone see my screen now? All right, perfect. And it's great to see everybody. I do see some familiar faces and of course our staff and Dr. Spiro and our board member. Um, this is gonna be a great year and it's very, very exciting. And we really do thank you for participating on this committee to advise and make recommendations to the board and to the superintendent. So the first thing I, I kind of want to go through is just to, I know we have some new board members. So for those of you who have heard my spiel before last year, um, please, if you have um, questions that go beyond this PowerPoint presentation, please stop me and ask me. For those who are new, I'm going to try to give you a little bit of some background in terms of what the board is looking for, as well as um, just some things to help run your meeting a little bit more smoothly. So the first thing is to talk a little bit about board policy 1.19, which is our policy that talks about community engagement. And really what the board is looking for is for the community to be engaged. We wanna be inclusive, focus on efforts to increase learning, try to build some consensus and open the doors of communication between the public, the board, as well as our administration. Board policy 1.20 is the actual policy that, that creates these different board advisory committees. And what the board is looking for is your input. You are members of the public and they want to hear what you have to say. What are your advice? What is it that you support? What things would you like to see done within the confines of your particular board advisory committee? And the other thing is to just note that um, may not be completely applicable in this advisory committees, but we do have some others where if you see that you will get a personal benefit or if you, um, a family member, will get a personal benefit, we will ask you to abstain from voting. For example, if your um, relative has a share, a large share, or president of McGraw-Hill, for example, we would ask that you re re um, re refrain yourself and abstain from voting. 
Now, how do you become a member of this advisory group? Well, you're appointed by the board. Each board member selects individuals to participate on the advisory committee so that it has a broad spectrum of representation. In addition, there is a requirement in terms of attendance. If you miss three meetings or more, and it shouldn't be more, but if you miss three meetings, you will be removed from the committee. And then how long do you serve? You serve for two years, two year terms. The board expects that you will be meeting from September through April, skipping December. Now, there are some committees that decide to meet during the summer, that's completely up to you, but at minimum from September through April, skipping December. And at your first meeting, you need to elect your chair and your vice chair, someone who's going to be able to help you with your um, agenda, your discussions, facilitate, make sure that your meetings are running smoothly. In addition, what is it that, how do you communicate with the board? How do you communicate with the administration? Once a quarter, you will be providing input to the superintendent. There's a group meeting of all of the chairs or their designees who meets with the superintendent and the staff liaison. And then that information is then brought forth by the same designee um, or different, depending on who the chair or the committee decides to, to send to the board so that they can also hear what your recommendations are. The committee meetings based on what the board has requested will be videotaped. I'm sorry, I'm, I, I think my tablet is ringing, my apologies. The committee meetings will be videotaped and you guys are a committee that is consider yourself an extension or an arm of the board, which means that you are subject to some of the same laws that are applicable to them, primarily sunshine laws, as well as public records law. Part of that is going to be allowing public comment for um, individuals and members of the public if they want to be able to share or give some thoughts. Um, in terms of what you guys are discussing. And because obviously this is a professional organization, a professional committee, you are an arm of the board. We do ask that you um, present yourself in the most professional way that you can with decorum. And you are now allowed to attend these meetings virtually. Prior to this year, um, you had to attend in person, but thank goodness for the legislature, they gave us a little bit of a reprieve and you can attend virtually. You have a liaison that works with your committee and that liaison is selected by the board. And this year, your board liaison is Melissa Giovanelli. And again, I already told you that you will be giving quarterly reports to the actual board themselves. But in between those quarterly reports, if there's something that you want to share with the board, you have your board liaison to do that for you and to bring matters to the board if you feel it's necessary. And so this committee is the Curriculum Advisory Committee. And your job is to provide advice and um, support with regards to our curriculum, give your suggestions, review materials, um, anything that you feel will be helpful in terms of our curriculum and improving our school processes. Remember, I will tell you this, that uh, we can't just build a curriculum from scratch. There is a statute that requires us to follow what we call the sunshine standards, which pretty much outlines what it is that we're supposed to be teaching our students. Now, you do have opportunity to discuss books and the other curriculum, but that's all part of it. And then, of course, technology. Um, how can we improve our technology and assist our students with becoming more, especially after COVID <laughs> from last year, we've learned a lot about technology. Is there anything we can improve and what did we learn? And those are the kind of things that you'll be talking about in this curriculum advisory committee. As I said, you are an arm of the board, which means that you're subject to some of the same laws that they are subject to. And that includes sunshine law, which is government in the open, in the sunshine, and then public records. Um, the thing that you really have to be um, 
careful with is communication, just like the board. You cannot communicate amongst yourselves unless you are on um, one of these meetings or in one of these meetings. Um, communication of any, when it, so let me back up a little bit. Sunshine, what does that mean? Well, there's just very simple principles. One, the meeting has to be open to the public. So anybody can come and, and, and observe and make a comment. Two, the, and just to be clear, because I know some individuals are on, on this call, I just wanna make sure that it's clear that public comment is not really part of Sunshine per se. There's lots of other things that goes along with that. But going back to um, um, Sunshine, the meeting has to be in the open. You have to take minutes of the meeting and he has to be noticed so that the public knows that you're having this meeting. So um, the district staff handles that for you to make sure that the public knows about these meetings. And, um, and all you guys have to do is really show up, but just make sure that you're not having substantive conversations about things that can come before you to vote uh, amongst yourselves. You should not be texting each other about things that can come before you for a vote. You should not be emailing each other about things that can come for a vote. Um, it can be a little bit more complicated and if there's issues that come up, just let me know and I can kind of really delve into Sunshine a little bit more, but that's pretty much the nuts and bolts. That's the gist of it. And then with regards to public records, just remember that every single document that you're actually creating is considered a public record. That means that um, any emails that are sent out, any minutes that are taken, these are things that are the public should have access to and are deemed public records. So be careful what you put in those emails because anybody can request to see all of the email communication in the curriculum advisory committee. And make sure that you maintain your emails. So if you make sure that staff is CC'd on pretty much all of the emails, we have our system that will capture those emails. So if anybody does ask for them, we will be able to provide it. Now, any questions on Sunshine or public records before I move forward? Okay, hearing no questions. Um, the next thing is that the board does want you to be successful in your meetings. And just like they do, they utilize something called Robert's Rules of Order, which is a form of parliamentary procedure and the most known um, form of parliamentary procedure to help with having an efficient meeting where you can actually have some very productive discussions and eventual outcomes. Our um, Policy says that we can proceed, advisory committees can proceed without a quorum. What I advise everybody is that you really need to have a majority plus one. That should be your quorum. And then of course, you'll have your chair and your vice chair. They will be elected to help you run your meeting and then you will need your agenda. So those are the basic things of Robert's Rules. Why use Robert's Rules? Well, it's, it really is there to help protect the interests of all members of your committee. Um, everyone has rights, the minority and the majority. So it protects the minority by allowing them to have a voice, to be able to discuss things. And then it respects the majority when you guys make your votes and then the majority rules. It allows for free and open discussion and everybody really needs to understand and forces really everyone to have a good understanding of what you guys are discussing and what you're voting on. So the main thing with Robert's rules is motions, what we call motions. And that is how you actually conduct the business. So I want to um, have a motion that we purchase some book, a book A for our sixth grade class. Now, how do I bring that to my committee for the committee to kind of consider this, that we wanna make this recommendation to the board? So you would do a motion. Nothing goes on the floor unless you do a motion. So how do you assign, how do you get the attention of the chair so that you can move forward with a motion? Well, what you would do is actually say it. 
I move that we buy book A for our sixth grade class. I'd like to make that recommendation to the board. Now your chair has to recognize you. Um, yes, sir, what would you like to do? Well, I like to make a motion and this is my motion. Now, in order for that motion to be valid for you to be able to move it forward to the next step, it needs to be seconded. You need to have another person on your committee think that it's, it's good enough for at least for us to at least have a discussion. So somebody else like Ms. Um, Jenkins can say, I move that we buy um, this book A for the, our sixth graders. And then Ms. Dye can second that motion. So what happens once it's seconded? At this point, you're opening it up for a discussion. And this is when you will go around to kind of see what's the viewpoint of everybody on our committee. Do you guys agree with buying book A? The chair should try to start with the person who actually made the motion. And then if you kind of have a, a, a gist of who agrees and who's for it and who's not for it, kind of go back and forth between the two camps. Before you start speaking, you make sure that you're recognized by the chair. So, um, Mr. Gillespie, do you want to say something? Yes, I'd like to agree with this motion. I think it's a good idea. Ms. Miller, do you agree? No, I, I don't agree. I think that we need to consider something different. So that's how you would have your discussion. Now, here's one little tip for you with regards to Robert's rules. Anytime that you're trying to limit somebody's right, Anytime that you're trying to close something or take away somebody's right, it needs more than a majority vote. It requires a two thirds vote. Normally, pretty much everything else in Robert's rules is by majority vote. But if I'm gonna close the debate, I need two thirds vote because you're limiting somebody's rights. The other thing is Robert's rule has a default with regards to how many times somebody can talk. And the default is twice for 10 minutes. But you guys have the flexibility of deciding what works best for your particular committee. But just make sure, and this is specifically for the chair, make sure that you try to make sure that everyone has equal access and has that opportunity to, um, to have a say. When you are discussing, it's really important to listen and be respectful, respect others, time. Don't monopolize the conversation. Stick to the subject. If you guys are talking about book A and then somebody comes in and says, well, book A is about the sixth graders. I'm more concerned about the elementary schools and I think we need to do this. That's not germane to the topic that you're discussing or the motion that is on the floor. So if you guys really try to hone in on what's actually pending, what's the motion, you'll, you really will have a better discussion. And quite frankly, not everybody gets along with each other, but you still have to do the business. So avoid bringing in personalities in your discussions. A lot of times what's very helpful is to be as formal as possible and to speak through the chair, meaning you're talking to the chair versus your individual members of your committee. Anything that you can do to try to keep any of those personalities if you are a committee that ends up having those types of struggles. All right, so we've been talking about this um, motion to buy this book A for our sixth graders, but you know, we're, we're talking about this and it's just getting too long. I think we've been talking about this for over an hour now. Um, excuse me, Mr. or Mrs. Chairman, I move that we limit our discussion at this point to two minutes per speaker. Remember, you are limiting somebody's rights. So that requires a two thirds vote. You know, we're even with the two minutes at this point, now we're looking at two hours on this discussion and we just have five more things on our agenda. We really, really need to move this along. Uh, excuse me, uh, Madam Chair, it's time for us to vote. I move for the pre previous question or I call for the vote. Again, it requires two thirds vote that limits debate and goes straight to the vote. Now, let's say that you've had your discussion and you are now ready for the vote. 
So the chair will say, okay, very formal Roberts rules. They would say, are you ready for the question? And then the, the, the members would say question, but you don't have to do that. The chair could say, um, at this time, we're getting ready to, to vote. And here is what we're voting on. It is a motion that was brought forth by, I believe it was Ms. Miller, seconded by Ms. Dye to purchase book A for our sixth grade class. And chairman, it's extremely important that you restate the motion that the, the uh, members will be voting on so they know exactly what is on the table. They need to understand what the motion is. And then once the vote is held, at that point, the chairman needs to say, okay, the motion carries by 12 to six, or the motion fails by 12 to six. Did, did you win or did you not win? Did the motion survive or did it not survive? Now, here is something sometimes that can happen where, you know, you're having a discussion about book A for our sixth graders, but someone says, well, what about book B? Can we go with book B? And you're really just trying to change the title or something like that. Um, Mr. Chairman, I move that we amend by taking out book A or by taking out A and substituting it with B. That's called an amendment. Or maybe you want to add a word. Uh, let's go with book A and B. Well, that's called an amendment. And here's where people really get confused about amendments. It is a two-step process. So if you're going to make an amendment, the first thing that the body is voting on is the actual amendment whatever words you're adding or taking out. Once the, the members vote on that part, then you will vote on the amendment, or I'm sorry, on the motion as amendment, as amended. You guys follow? So the first part is, are we going to exchange A for B? Does everybody agree to exchange A for B? Yes, we do. Okay, at this time, because you guys voted to exchange A for B, now we will move with the new amended motion, the motion as amended, which is now book B, okay? So remember, it is a two-step process. You do need a second for an amendment, and then you can only do two amendments per motion. Let's say that you want to, um, change a larger section of the motion. Maybe it's not just a word you wanna replace or add. Let's say that you wanna completely change the whole thing. Well, instead of this, this book A for the sixth graders, I really think that we need to concentrate on the seventh graders and get book X. That's a completely different motion. Um, but you think that, that it needs to be substituted. We're looking at the wrong grade in the wrong book. I like to substitute motion, um, that motion with this motion, which is to buy book X for our seventh graders. That's a huge change that's called a substitution. You know, I think we need to get more information on this book A, B, and X. We just don't have enough information. Can we please postpone this question? And remember question in this sense is motion. Can we please postpone this motion until our next meeting? Or can we please table this motion into our next meeting? Robert's rules is usually better to postpone than to table an item so you can be more specific as to when you're going to hear it. Or maybe this is the fourth time that your committee is discussing book A and B and you just don't think you're gonna get anywhere and it's really, it keeps coming up on the agenda, but we're not going anywhere. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Chairman, Madam Chairman, I think we need to postpone this question indefinitely. And that basically kills the motion. It won't come back up again. You know, after hearing discussion from my um, members and my colleagues here, I, I kind of agree with them. I don't think we should move forward with, with this purchase of book A. They really have changed my mind after hearing the discussion. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to withdraw my motion altogether. I just don't think we need to discuss this. Or 
here you are in the, the meeting and you guys are going way off tangent. You're supposed to be on agenda item number one and you guys have skipped all the way down to agenda item number six because there was a heated discussion and you just got caught off tangent. What do you do? Excuse me, I call for the orders of the day. We need to get back on track. We need to get back on our agenda. You know, I have to go pick up my daughter in about 15 minutes, but I know you guys are talking about book A, and I have something very pressing to say about that because I read it and I have some concerns. Excuse me, Ms. Mrs. Um, Chairman, can you please move item number five, which is about book A, to position number two? Because I really have something to say and I can't wait. I, I really want to move the agenda. The other way to do that is just to when you adopt your agenda at the beginning of your meeting, you can move it at that time too. Say, you know, prior to adopting the agenda, can we move item number five to number two, please? And then the agenda will be adopted as amended. You know, we're in this meeting in the boardroom today and it's just kind of cold. Is there any way we can get the heat on or it's Florida, so you probably want to have heat, but I'm in a fall mood. So, um, or maybe you can't hear because somebody, there's some noise in the background and somebody's not putting themselves on mute. Excuse me, point of personal privilege. I can't hear or it's too cold or it's too hot. That's a personal privilege that I need to adjust the, the room or the temperature or what have you. You guys are having this discussion and it's really getting out of order and people are just way off task and it's getting kind of heated and we're not getting our work done. Excuse me, point of order, or I'll rise to a point of order. And what's supposed to happen is your chair is supposed to say, can you please state what's your point of order? What's the problem? What's the issue? And then you're supposed to say, well, you know, they're having a sidebar discussion and we can't even hear what they're saying and they're completely off topic and we need to get back to our business. And then the chair would make a ruling on your point of order. Your point of order is well taken, we're gonna go back on track or no, it's not well taken, but they were discussing is something that is relevant to our motion. Let's say that you just need more information. And, and guys, this is very, very formal Robert's rules. So we may not, you, I'm sure you're not gonna use all of this, but just so you know that there are some things out there that can help you with running your meeting. Let's say that you are discussing book A and then you realize that, you know, we wanna buy book A, but we don't even know how much this costs. So excuse me, Mr. Chairman, point of information, we really need to know how much do these books cost and what is it gonna, cost the district before we make this recommendation to the board. I remember that the board attorney was here and she said that there are certain motions that we got to vote by majority and there are certain motions that we have to vote that is two thirds and I just can't remember which one if this motion is one of them or not. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Chairman, point of parliamentary inquiry. I need to know or double check what the rule is with regards to this motion. All right, you guys are gonna be doing this today. How do we do nominations and elections? Um, Chair, nominations are now in order and I would like to nominate um, Mr. X for chairman. Are there any further nominations? No, there are no further nominations. Well, then the nomination is closed. If it's only one candidate, you can elect by acclamation. All right, so once you are the chairman or the vice chairman, it's really, really important because you are the one who is responsible for running the meeting. You're the person who's responsible to make sure that motions are being made properly. You're responsible to make sure everybody has a turn. Remember what Robert's rules are to protect the minority um, while you give the right of the majority or the majority has their um, say. So that's your job as the chair. Pose the question, restate the motion, help sometimes with wording of the motion if your member is having a hard time. Rule on the motion if it's not in order. Well, you know, we have a motion on the floor right now and this other motion is not applicable or we can't even discuss it because we still have a pending motion. 
you bring the debate, you open up the discussion and the debate, you process the vote, and then you announce the results. All of those are extremely important in operating a, a meeting. Let's say that the chair makes a ruling and you completely disagree. Well, I appeal the chair. You need a second, and then everyone can talk on it one time, except for the chair who can talk on it twice. And then lastly, one other thing in Robert's rules is what they call good of the order. This is an opportunity for you to um, make comments to your committee, um, things that you think are going well, observations. And if there's an issue with a member or anything like that, this is also an opportunity to be able to discuss that. And with that, are there any questions? Anybody have questions for me? No? Okay, very good. All right, so I guess I'm gonna hand it back off to Lori, I think. Thank you. While we're on gallery mode, I thought I'd let everybody just kind of go around and, um, oops, Bethany, sorry. Uh, introduce themselves because the next thing on our agenda is to elect a chair and you probably want to get to know one another before um, before you elect a chair. So um, I am just going to kind of call as I see them. You may not be in the same order as I see them, but the first person I see is Melvin. Sorry, Melvin. No, don't apologize. <laughs> Uh, yes, I am Melvin Whitlock. I am uh, an employee with the Lee County School District at South Fort Myers High School. Um, I'm a doctoral student at uh, Florida Gulf Coast University. This is my eighth year in education. Um, I chose to be on the curriculum advisory committee because I do understand or applied for it because I do understand the importance of um, guiding our youth in the next direction with the best uh, material as possible. Um, being on the inside as an educator, um, it's important to have the right content to deliver the kid to deliver for the kids in order for them to be successful in the educational setting. So I look forward to working with everybody um, in here, Dr. Spiro, uh, Ms. Houchin, all of you guys um, are doing tremendous work for the school district. Uh, Ms. Giovanelli, I've met you before and I'm Really looking forward to working with you also. So um, hopefully I can be a valuable asset to this uh, committee. Thank you. Thank you, Melvin. And thank you for uh, teaching this year. I know it's been a tough couple of years. Um, Pamela. Hello, I was just looking to see if there was another Pamela in here. <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Pam Jenkins. I go by Pam usually. Um, I am the Intervention Support Specialist at Lehigh Acres Middle School. This is my 18th year with the district. I actually resigned uh, for a couple of years, but I came back. Um, I have a background of teaching math, um, algebra, and geometry for eight years, and then I went into teaching psychology, AP, and dual enrollment with uh, East Lee County. Um, I'm just very passionate about curriculum, um, math background, and um, also mental health is very important to me. So that's kind of where I come from. Glad to be here. Thank you for being with us and thank you for what you do. Andrea. Hi, I'm Andrea Miller. Um, I work for Lee County Mosquito Control District. I'm their education coordinator. Um, I've been in education and or public administration for over 20 years. Uh, my undergrad is in education. My master's is in public administration. Um, I have two students in the district and I was born and raised here in Lee County. So um, I look forward to supporting our school district in any way that I can. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Andrea. Dave? Hello, uh, I'm Dave Montrose. I'm a science teacher at Mariner High School. Um, this is my 11th year teaching. Um, I also stepped away from it for a few years and uh, got a master's in social work and worked, spent some time working in nonprofits, but now I'm back in teaching. Um, my, I have five kids in the district. Um, and even though I teach science now, most of my uh, career has been in social studies. Thank you so much. Alicia? 
Hi, everybody. My name is Felicia Smith, and um, I work at Florida Gulf Coast University. I'm Assistant Director of Exploratory Advising, and I also adjunct, um, I teach public speaking, and um, I've been in advising and higher ed for 11 years, and um, my kids go to these schools as well. So my son is at Estero High School. My daughter's at a charter school at Athenian Academy, and I've really seen my son step up and get involved in school board meetings, which has been um, fun <laughs> and interesting. So I wanted to, you know, get involved as well. We're new to Florida, and I really want to be involved in the community and, um, you know, have my voice heard and hear your voices and really be a part of this. So thank you so much for letting me join. Thank you for joining us, Felicia. Mark? Well, I might be the oddball out tonight. My name is Mark Gillespie. I'm not involved in the school district in any way, shape, or form. Um, I've been in Lee County since 1986, raised three kids. Uh, they're all graduated. They, we homeschooled. The um, reason why I wanted to be on the committee is there's been an awful lot of uh, changes happening in the world. I've seen a lot of that overflowing into the schools, and I can't say I'm real happy about it. So I just wanted to have a voice and um, try to add maybe a, a different perspective than because um, there are two sides to every argument. And I would like to be uh, just some, someone who, who uh, listens in, offers advice, and tries to uh, maybe add a different uh, perspective to what we may or may not be doing. Thank you, Mark, and we appreciate having different perspectives. Tanya? Hi, everyone. My name is Tanya Kunberger. I am a faculty member at Florida Gulf Coast University. Um, I'm actually chair of the Department of Environmental Engineering, Civil Engineering, and Construction Management. Um, so I have two students in the school district. And I've been involved in higher education for about 15 years. And as many of you probably know, uh, FGCU gets a number of their students from Lee County. And so I'm excited to be involved with the curriculum committee um, from that perspective, because I see what students come from that district into our university. Thank you so much. We love partnering with FGCU staff for sure. Daniela? Hi, my name is Daniela Dye, and I have um, three kids in the district that were pulled to be homeschooled. So Mark, you're not completely alone. <laughs> um, I'm a mom, I'm homeschooled. I've been doing curriculum reviews for quite a number of years. I've actually helped write a few books and um, reviewed curriculums for a few publishers. So I have a little bit of a background in the material itself as long as well as the state guidelines. Thank you. We're happy to have your expertise. Christina. Hi, sorry, I'm losing my voice. So I'm gonna try to keep it like short. <laughs> I'm a third grade teacher at Trafalgar Elementary. I um, was a pro or I am a product of the Lee County School District K to 12. Um, I currently have a daughter who's in second grade with the district. And right now I am in my master's in curriculum and instruction at FGCU. Thank you so much. It's great to see you again. Nice to see you too. Ben? Did you say Jen or Tom? Jen, sorry. Hi, um, I am Jen Fulwider. I am an instructor at Florida Gulf Coast University. I actually teach in teacher prep. So not only do we get our fabulous Lee County students, we also give them back to you, hopefully with a better understanding of how to work in a classroom. I am a former teacher. I taught special education in Michigan and Ohio for 13 years. And I'm also uh, doing my doctorate. I'm actually in my dissertation phase. So hats off to you, Melvin, and I think Christina, who's also back in school. Um, someday we will sleep again. <laughs> no time soon. Yeah. Right. That, that is a monumental ask. Hats off to you both, or three of you, actually. Jolene? Oh, I, oh sorry. I, I had two kids in Lee County. They both go to Fort Myers High. Awesome. 
Julene, am I saying that correctly? You're on mute, sorry. Yes, ma'am, you did say my name correctly. I'm a parent with two kids in the Lee County School District, a seventh grader at Lee High Acres Middle and a junior at Dunbar Middle School in the IB program. And I work for South Florida Water Management District, um, environmental resource protection. So I have a background in engineering, science, mathematics, and project management, a lot of different areas. But I'm grateful to have opportunity to be part of this committee because I'm very involved with my children's education. And I've been questioning things I've seen over the years. I'm a product of a public school education of Volusia County, Florida. And I just see so many, I mean, I know I'm a hundred years old, but I just feel like that much shouldn't have changed in that time. I understand changing with the times, but I'm just interested in um, seeing what's going on and how I can be a part of things. Thank you. We're happy to partner with you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Melissa. Oh, you're on mute. I'm sorry. Sorry, I thought I unclicked it. I am Melissa Rodriguez Meehan. I am an assistant professor at FGCU in the College of Education. Uh, I teach mostly child development, uh, some social studies methods, um, but I'm very passionate about education. I was in K-12 for about 10 years uh, prior to uh, taking a break for a couple years, um, and I'm excited to be here. Thank you for joining us. Kay Schuler, I'm hoping I pronounced that correctly. Hi, I am Dr. Kelly Schuler. I am a faculty member in the Department of Psychology. I'm also chair of the department at FGCU. Um, I've been in higher ed for 15 years. I've been in an administrative role for five. I've also been involved in um, multiple accreditation processes. Uh, and my daughter is in Three Oaks Middle right now, so I'm invested all the way around, and I look forward to working with everyone. Thank you so much. Brian? Yes, how are you? Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. All good right. Well, my, my, good to see you as well. My name is Brian DeGrazio. Um, I'm, I have four kids uh, that are gonna be, will be going to district schools. Two of them already are school age, and two not quite there yet. I'm here as a community member, uh, uh, work as a critical care nurse in Cape Coral Hospital, but uh, very interested in curriculum and, uh, and um, thank you for allowing, allowing me to be a part. Thank you for joining us. Yep. Okay, did I miss anyone? Okay, so at this time we are going to, um, you can either step up and nominate yourself to be chair or someone can nominate someone as chair. Um, and that responsibility all, with running the meeting as our board attorney went over. Um, also, you will work with um, Bethany, Candace, Dr. Spiro and I, and Ms. Giovanelli, and we will um, generate an agenda based on the topics that the um, committee showed interest in. Um, so we work to, to create the agenda and then our responsibilities from there is to make sure that we post the agenda and we send the emails and the reminders and the invites and set up the Zoom links and so forth and so on. Um, so just generating the agenda and running the meetings um, and even taking apart, we've had chairs who have actually presented on topics before. So those are pretty much the gamut of the responsibilities. Team, did I leave anything out? Okay, I don't think so then. So anybody, if and since we're on Zoom, if you would just say your name and then say who you would like to nominate or nominate yourself, it would be helpful. My name's Brian DeGrazio. I'd be willing to be chair if you'd have me. Thank you, Brian. Anyone else? Okay, so I think that the advice given to us is to ask, is there any opposition would be the easiest because we're on Zoom, is that right? 
So let's make sure, let's just make sure if there's any other nominations for chair. Well, um, I will uh, step up and I'd like to be considered for the chair position also. Um, this is Melvin Whitlock speaking. Um, and I didn't uh, specify that I do have a background in terms of teaching US history for seven years. So that's particularly my um, curriculum focus, but um, I'd like to uh, be considered for the chair position also. Okay, thank you. Anyone else interested? Okay, so at this point, hearing no other nomination, the nominations are now closed. And then you can go ahead, Lori. And, and, and you're gonna have a little bit of a different um, issue here because you have two people who have been nominated. Um, Brian DeGracio and Melvin, I'm sorry, Melvin, what is your last name? Whitlock, W-H-I-T-L-O-C-K. All right, so at this point you have two nominations, Brian DeGracio, DeGracio and Melvin Whitlock. I think the best way to do this is to go ahead and do your roll call. So everyone's name will be called and then you will just state of those two potential chairs who you would like to have as your chair. Okay. Um, Helen, do you have the list? Otherwise we'll have to go back on the gallery view as I don't have the list. Lori, she said yes. Her um her sound's not working, but I can hear her through the wall, so she has the list. So, are you, Candace, are you going to call the roll then? And yep, I'm going to call them in the same order in which that they introduce themselves. So, I'm going to go straight down the list. So, Melvin, present. No, you, you should say if you're going to vote for yourself or for Mr. DeGracia. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Uh, yes. Um, I vote for myself. Thank you, Melvin. Pam? I'd like to vote for Melvin. Thank you, Pam. Andrea? Trying to unmute. I'd vote for Melvin. Thank you, Andrea. Dave? Melvin Whitlock. Thank you. Felicia? I'd like to vote for Melvin. Okay. Thank you. Mark? President, I'll vote for the parent, Brian. Thank you, Mark. Tanya? I'd like to vote for Brian, please. Thank you, Tanya. Daniela? I would also like to vote for Brian, please. Thank you. Christina? Um, Melvin, please. Thank you. Jen? I vote for Melvin. Thank you. Julene? Is it Julene? I'm sorry. Julene. You're on mute. Julene, we're just trying to capture your vote for either. Yes, Brian. I can. I can. I found the unmute. I um, vote for Melvin. Thank you. Melissa. Melvin. Kelly. Melvin. Brian. <clears throat> Excuse me, Brian. Thank you. And then Rachel, I know you just joined us this evening. We are currently in the process of voting for our chair. Um, we have between Melvin and Brian. Melvin, if you would just give a quick introduction of yourself and what you do. And then Melvin, after you introduce Brian, if you would do the same. So Rachel can hear that. Hi, Rachel. Uh, yes, I'm Melvin Whitlock. I am an employee with the Lee County School District uh, with the JFG program here at South Fort Myers High School. I've worked in education for 
seven years now as a teacher, 14 years working in other instructional assistant positions. Um, I'm also a coach in the area, um, have been doing that for 14 years, also originally from Virginia. Um, curriculum instruction is important to me because it's um, because I've had to uh, use it as a guide for my students whenever we take the standardized testing. So I wanna just make sure that uh, we are moving in the right direction when it comes to uh, curriculum um, for the future generation and our students. So thank you. And Melvin, thank you for that. And as you said that, I am sorry, Helen came in. This is the problem with technology every once in a while. And Helen has let us know, Rachel may not be one of our voting members. So since we have had all of our voting members present, and I'm going to ask Helen to just double check our list. Okay. Rachel is a public member joining us tonight. So thank you for being here, Rachel. So with that, I believe Dr. Spiro, you are keeping count as well. So I have 10 votes um, for Melvin and four votes for Brian. Is that what you wrote down as well? That's exactly what I wrote down as well. Okay, so then Lori, we have our chair. Do we want to go ahead and elect the vice chair as well? Yes. Does anyone have a nomination? Yeah, does anyone have a nomination for vice chair? Yes, I'd like to nominate Brian uh, as vice chair. If he's willing to step up to be the chair position, then I would love to work with him um, and hopefully we can make it an effective board. Um, I'd be willing if you have me. Awesome. Okay. Do we go through the whole roll again, or can we get Hold a on. second? Do we have any other nominations for vice chair? Are there any other nominations for vice chair? Hearing no other nominations for vice chair, nominations are now closed for the position of vice chair. At this time, because you only have one nominee for vice chair, at this time, are there any objections? And, and really you only have one so we can do it by acclamation, but I'm just gonna go through this so you guys can see how to do it. Um, are, at this time, are there any objections to the nomination of Brian DeGrazio for vice chair? Any objections to Brian DeGrazio for vice chair? Hearing no objections, Mr. Brian DeGrazio is the vice chair by unanimous consent or by acclamation because there was nobody else that was um, there. So congratulations, Chair and Vice Chair. I think I've done my job for the night. Good night, everybody. Have a great meeting and see you tomorrow, Dr. Spiral and the rest. Kathy, before you, uh, before you sign off, we wanna just address the chat box real quick. So I know everybody's used to using the chat box and this will be different for our advisories. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. so. We talked a little bit about sunshine and how um, you really need to make sure that all of your discussions and everything that you do is out in the sunshine. People who are watching you or um, cannot view your chat box. So I do not want any of the advisory committees to uh, use the chat box because you may be able to see what the chat is and what you guys are talking about, but the public who may be watching is not going to be able to see that. And we haven't figured out how to upload that just yet. So at this point, just to make sure that we're all in compliance with Sunshine, please do not use the chat box. Okay, anything you. else you want me to address? We're good? Okay, all right, everybody have a good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. So, so Melvin, uh, we I can, do some of these items for you, or you can take over the agenda. I'm going to let you determine how you want to run this. Well, preferably because I still want to um, get more acclimated with the um, PowerPoint that was just presented. I would prefer if you could do that for me, Lori. Sure. So um, typically we take, just so you know, typically all of this kind of stuff is going to be at the beginning of the agenda. Uh, but since our board attorney had um, another presentation to do tonight, uh, we moved her up. So um, 
we do the reading and the approval of this agenda. So I'll give everybody, a, um, you were sent this by email, um, but just give you a second to just look over the agenda and determine whether or not you approve the agenda as written. Any objections to the agenda? Motion to right. approve. Thank you. Second. Awesome. And no objections? Okay. And then um, the minutes from our last meeting, which uh, typically we, uh, we would have last minutes from April, but um, we did not have enough uh, members present March or April to have a formal meeting. So our minutes have actually not been approved since last um, January. So these are the uh, meeting minutes from February. And I know this is difficult because we only have a couple of you who were actually present during this meeting. Um, but if if you've reviewed this and you have no objections, I um, would ask that someone make a motion to approve the minutes. I'll make the motion to approve the minutes. Second. Thank you. And a second? Second. Thank you. Any objections? Seeing none, it's approved. And then at the very top of your agenda, uh, this mission statement was written, I would say three or four years ago. So uh, we'll give you a chance to review that. Um, nothing that we have to vote on, but it could be something that um, the chair and, the, and our vice chair determined that they want to change. But as of now, this is our mission statement. It's very wordy. Okay, and then um, at this time, we'll open the floor for any public comment. If any, I think we have one member of the public. Um, the public comment has to be on the agenda. Lori, Rachel left the meeting. So at this time, we don't have any members of the public. We only have our voting members. Okay. So we can close that. And that moves us to our board member report. Ms. Giovanelli. Hi. I don't have anything either because this is my first time. But I just want to welcome everybody again and uh, congratulate the chair and vice chair. And I'm excited to see how this goes. Um, I do, I had a parent that actually gave me a book for us to look at um, and some, they had screenshot me some things in it that they were very upset over it. So I think that I'll bring that back up at the next meeting, but I just thought I'd throw it out there at this point in time. But anyways, and welcome back to those teachers that are that are back and, um, and I'm, I'm excited to see the FGCU um, as a staff as well, uh, them being on here because I think that's awesome. So I think it's gonna be a, a great group and I'm excited. So thank you so much. Is it out thank of order to ask a question right now? No. Right. I was just wondering, Melissa, would you mind sending an email out or some sort of communication with the title of the book so we can have the opportunity to review it before you bring it up at the next meeting? No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna send you the information and I'll send out the, the screenshots that the parent sent me and um and everything so that we'll all have it and and uh one question i do have is will all our meetings always be zoom or will we be in person do, do we know that so we have the option to um have hybrid meetings we have the option to just do zoom no see well, only only face to face or zoom we have to decide okay. between just the two of those gotcha no hybrid okay Okay, so I'll just, I'll wait for the consensus of the of the um of this board. So 
of the committee. So thank you very much. Okay. And then um, one of the things every year is we have typically textbook adoption um, that we rely on our curriculum advisory. Earlier today, um, we had the kind of the publisher showcase that um, all of our community members and our teachers, typically we have it face-to-face, -face, but we did not tonight. We did that virtual because of the COVID numbers. But, um, but we, um, so this year is math textbook adoption. And um, we have the best standards for math that are implemented K through two right now. And will be, uh, no, I'm sorry, K through 12 will be implemented next year for math. This year was K2 for ELA and next year is three through 12 ELA. So um, last year we went through the English language arts adoption and this year we're, we're beginning our math adoption. And we always hope that we have a member or two or three of our curriculum advisory uh, team committee members that they also serve on the textbook adoption committee so that they can speak to the process um, and kind of get a look on how we do that. So I'm gonna just go over a little bit of what the process is for the math textbook adoption. I sent you some, we sent you some links uh, or a link um, with the timeline so that you have the dates ahead of time. And that's also linked at the top of this and we'll send this out to you. So on the left-hand side is what the state does to get ready for the yearly textbook adoption. So they establish the adoption cycle. Sometimes they revise the adoption cycle. Um, so like we, they've had us hold before um, and not adopt. Um, and then they establish the publisher specifications, like all of the rules and regulations that they have to abide by, the rubric, um, they have to provide their evidence correlation, so their efficacy um, on how effective their curriculum is. And then they do a call for bids. Once they do a call for bids, they generate their long bid list. Once they generate the long bid list, then that lets the districts know who to contact. At this time right now, they've done a call for expert reviewers. So that's anyone in the community and or uh, in education who has experience in math um, and they um, can apply to be an expert reviewer um, and to kind of look through to make sure that the textbook companies are meeting the needs of the standards um, and that they're also following that rubric and that guideline process. And then from there, that generates the short bid list and then they establish the uh, purchasing and funding guidelines from there. So on the district side of that, we establish and post our timeline for adoption and we build rubrics and we communicate and do a call for committee members. Then we establish a district publisher guideline and we provide timelines. So we meet with the publishers ahead of time um, and go over the district guidelines and the state guidelines. Then we have what we had tonight is the publisher showcase. Um, and after the publisher showcase, we, um, they are then generating, um, they have all the information to generate their presentations. Um, we then um, do a nomination form that we send to all of our principals, letting them know how many committees that we'll have and how many members we need, as well as we, um, put all of this information on our website so that community members can also participate. So we call for that community participation. From there, we determine the committee members and they attend trainings. Um, they attend trainings on like the standards, they attend trainings on the rubrics, the publishers do their presentations, they do deliberation with um, interest-based, um, we do that interest-based so they come to consensus essentially. Um, we, from there, once the committees have, um, we typically ask them to do their top two and, and they rank them who's first, who's second. Sometimes we do a third if, if it's close. Um, we brief the board. We open it up for public comment. There's a 30 day objection period. And if there are any objections, then we also have to have a hearing officer um, present at the next board meeting uh, to listen to that. And then once we go through that process, 
we do a consent item on the board meeting agenda. And then once it is all been approved, we um, look at those purchasing decisions. We gather all of their orders, we place the orders. We then as a curriculum team, we begin revising like our instructional guides, our curriculum map, our scope and sequence, um, because textbooks are just a resource, but um, we include some of those resources in there. And then we train our teachers on the new materials and the revisions to the instructional guides. So that's kind of our process for both the state and the district level. On the um, timeline right now, as I said, we're at, we did the publisher showcase, it began at four, um, but the committee members, if they didn't attend that, they'll get the publisher presentations when they're in committee. So, um, that's kind of where we are in the, in the process. We'll send this to you and that links to that math textbook adoption, but you already have that link uh, in your email that we sent you. And so what we would like for you to do, you don't have to commit tonight, but we would like for you to look at that timeline. And then if you're interested in serving on our textbook adoption committee for math, we have um, elementary, we have middle, and we have high school. Um, we do have students who serve on this committee, community members, and then um, our math teachers uh, that the principals nominated. Any questions about the process or any information that you need to know to help you make a decision? I have two quick questions. Um, sure. I heard recently, and if I'm incorrect, please somebody correct me, um, but I heard recently that the uh, state Florida State has said that there's uh, they're abandoning any kind of standardized testing, uh, that that's not going to be part of what Florida does anymore. So I didn't know if that decision affects this format that we have. And then maybe I heard wrong, but I was trying to listen very carefully in the, in the last box here. You said that the textbook serves as a guideline. Um, does that mean that a teacher can bring in something other than the textbook in order to teach subject matter, whether it be math or, or anything else? Uh, we build instructional guides for our teachers, which is a backward design lesson planning tool, um, or lesson plan basically. And we do use other resources besides the textbook. So um, we may use resources from state sites like CPALMS, um, floridastudents.org, that kind of thing. Um, so it's, it is um, a core resource that teachers can utilize, but we also um, guide them to other resources. And then and are those other resources available to the public as well? Yeah, well, typically we just use things like Khan Academy and things like that that the public does okay. have access to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'm we. Familiar with Khan it, Academy. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, also on your second question, um, so the governor determined that um, this would be the last year of FSA, which it always was going to be the last year of FSA because the standards um, will have changed after this year. And then um, what he has proposed, it still has to pass through legislation, is that there would not be an end of year like summative test any longer, that there would be three shorter progress monitoring tests that are adaptive, meaning that they kind of move up and down in difficulty based on how the students are doing. So it becomes more uh, progress monitoring and kind of diagnostic than an end of year test. And that is all the information that we have right now because we're waiting to see if that passes legislation. I do believe honestly that it will impact um, some of what the publishers have produced. Um, so they may have to adjust their assessment platforms um, to match um, that, but other than that, um, it doesn't it doesn't change the standards any because the standards were already adopted um, and went through legislation. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. You're very welcome. I have a few questions. I'm sorry, let me answer one more thing, Daniela, to Mark to answer one of those questions um, about the resources, especially in elementary. It is extremely difficult um, for a publisher to provide all foundational resources that would need to go um, into the materials for ELA and for math. For example, our math um, curriculum won't have math fluency. 
Um, and so we purchase programs such as Reflex, or then we also use the toolbox inside of iReady for um, teachers to be able to have resources that um, include those foundational resources. Same with, with ELA. ELA is going to be the core ELA standards that are in the textbooks. It doesn't cover um, phonics or phonological awareness or reading fluency. And so we typically purchase an additional program that yes, is open um, for public review um, that are in those classrooms as well to ensure that we're covering the foundational standards too. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you know, because with everything going on in the world and you hear all these stories about stuff slipping in through curriculum and teachers having their own agenda and I'm not accusing anybody of anything. Oh so yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> But as long as everything's public, above board, everything's transparent, then I don't, it's, it's fine. A, a better way to put it is they do not teach the textbook cover to cover. They don't open a textbook and just go page by page. We provide resources for that. Okay. I'm sorry, and As Daniela, long as those don't. resources are available, that's great. They are, yes. Okay, thank Go you. ahead, Daniela, I'm sorry. No, that's totally fine. Um, I did have a few questions. So the bids were discussed at the state level, but do we know what they are when we're reviewing them as a district? And what is our criteria for reviewing the material? So um, guidelines specifically is like, I went to the presentation today, I reviewed the publisher's information, they sent me to a video. From the video, I had questions, I went back into the chat and spoke to the representative. They said they only had um, the criteria the curriculum in English and Spanish. And I was under the impression that we needed to provide curriculum in Creole as well for the school district. So they did not have that available. Um, they did have some, they did have an online resource as well as printed materials. So I'd like to see some sort of criteria for selecting this, like does it need to be printed and on um, available digitally? Is it something that needs to be printed in three, languages? Is it something that needs to be accessible offline? Like what is the criteria specifically that we're looking for besides the fact that it meets state standards? And then um, the financial impact of all of those, what would the impact be to the district for each of the different um, curriculums that were proposed? And um, it also said something about the timeline that seems to be passed. So it says establish district publisher guidelines and provide timeline, which seems to be something that already happened, but I don't see that timeline published anywhere. So I wanted to see if we have a copy of that. So the timeline is published on our um, on the district's website. It's been up there for some time. And um, as soon as the state does their timeline, then we generate our own timeline. And we try to have our materials like all the way through the board process by April, um, because then we have to look at um, what the state will provide in funding um, and then determine uh, what to order from each school and then get those materials um, into the schools before the end of the year um, and begin our training. So. That timeline is posted on the district website, but we can we can um, also send it to you, the link to you as well. But it should be on the link that was on. Um, you should have a link from the one that I sent on the email. I do see one on the district's website under departments, academic services, curriculum and instruction, instructional materials, and it's the first thing that comes up. It's a timeline for adoption cycle, but I didn't know if there was a specific one that was different from this general. And that's why I was asking. I didn't know. Or why don't you guys walk the group through? Like, how do you access our page that has all this information so the group so the group can see it? I had a question while you're doing that. How does this impact children in Lee Virtual School? Since Lee Virtual is like a franchise of Florida Virtual, would they also be using textbooks adopted or information adopted by the Lee County School District? They typically do not use the same materials um, that we use. We do meet with them uh, to try to get a similar scope and sequence semester by semester as that's when students would transition. But um, they use, um, they, they have to teach the same standards, um, but they generally um, contract with like Florida virtual, that kind of thing to generate curriculum from that. And then Danielle, your other question while they're pulling up the website is, um, is that the state, they do their guidelines and we work up with those guidelines. Our math team does to establish a rubric 
And then whoever's on the committee, they look at the rubric and they decide um, from there, are there any revisions or additions they wanna make to the rubric? And then they use that rubric um, to judge the presentations. And then they actually have the curriculum both online and uh, any prep materials. And when we go, at, when we work in our committee, they work to um, ensure that what's meeting the rubric and what's not meeting the rubric. And then from there, it moves to deliberation. So Candace, are you driving? I am, I figure I drive. And then as you said that though, Danielle, it stemmed a thought that I'm gonna drop out there to Melvin to think about. It may be a good topic for next meeting as we're thinking about what those rubrics look like that this group may be interested in having and viewing those and seeing what they are. We do follow state guidelines. So the state instructional materials page has rubric criteria that we have to evaluate as well. And then as Lori said, our curriculum team weighs in, develops, and then the committee members look at those and prioritize. So I'm gonna show you a couple different ways to get there. So off of our main landing page, I'm gonna walk you through all the breadcrumb trail if you'd like. And then I'm also gonna give you my, what I call cheater method. So if you notice scrolling across the banner, there will be a banner here that was actually the publisher showcase for tonight. Laura Howard, our one of our webmasters does a great job. We'll be continuing to have a banner here to keep our public um, knowledge in what's going on with textbook adoption. But the breadcrumb trail, you would go our district, departments, academic services. So those are the first couple, our district, departments, academic services. From here, you're gonna to go to curriculum and instruction. So this is where textbook adoption process lives. It lives in the curriculum and instruction department. And then over here on the left-hand side, you're gonna see curriculum standards and instructional materials. And this is where you can get to all of our information. And now I'm going to give you the cheater method. If I go back to the home screen and in your search bar, you'll notice it's one of my searches. I search it a lot because it's the fastest way to get there. I should just bookmark it for myself. If I type in instructional materials and search, I go to the most updated one, September 20th, 2021. Here is the timeline that Ms. Dye was actually referencing. So you're going to see this is how you access all of our instructional materials, our process where we are right now. So we have announced our committee members. We're down here in the September 27th. So publisher showcase and digital access will all get posted tonight. So it's live now for anybody going to the publisher showcase, but we will be making it live. So this will keep stay up to date. We're continuously updating this. You'll see a handful that are TBA at the moment. This all depends upon board meeting dates. So since we don't have board meeting dates set yet moving forward, knowing when we reach deliberations, these are why they're TBA. Once we have our actual meeting date set and we map out the process to get to adoption, then all of these get filled in with those dates. So that's how you get to the place that will give you all of the information, kind of keep you up to date on all of it. And Danielle, I think you had three questions. I'm trying to think between Lori and I, if we answered all three of those questions that you had. Oh, I'd like a copy of the rubrics. And if we could, Melvin, put it on the list of things that we're going to discuss so that we can actually figure out what the priorities are for our district. And then um, the financial impact, that was the missing third question. That was your third question. So that <laughs> one's huge. Thank you for the um, yeah. review on that one. So when our teacher teams get together and the committee members, community members, parents, students who sit on here, we ask them not to consider finances. So we don't ever talk about how much something is going to cost. Instead, we ask you to review the materials based upon what's gonna be in the best interest of our students and our teachers. 
once we pick or they pick i should say because as district folks we do not have a vote in this it is all run by the committee members once they make a selection then we also ask them which ties to one of your other questions is do you want these things in all print do you want them print and digital would you like just class sets and we get the feedback from the teachers who are going to be utilizing the materials inside the classrooms then we present this information to the board so it actually goes before the board we have public hearing on it and once the board says you have our blessing for it we get we start the negotiation process for price because all of the publishers have to put together packages, bid packages of what it's going to cost. But at the end of the day, that's not the final price. So we pull together items, our class sizes, we work with the materials that we actually need and what the committees come back and say, hey, we really wanna make sure this is inside every classroom, that, hey, we need manipulatives in all of our primary classrooms. And that's then how the finances come in. But once we reach that point, before we give those final totals, that's where it will hit the board. And those are implications are there. But the committee members, we don't ever talk about finances inside the committees. So, and I wrote down rubric for us for next time. So thank you. I think one of the other concerns that Danielle had was if something had to be printed in a different language, um, obviously English and Spanish, but there was a mention about Creole. Um, I think one of the questions specifically originated around the finances was, are we going to know how much it's going to cost to get curriculum in a language if it's not currently available? Or would it be made available or would there be an alternative uh, source for that? I love all your questions and to our chair, I think they might be doing a really good job of starting to generate lists for us of next topics and steps, because a lot of what you guys are sharing are part of like on the rubric when we're talking about languages, things that are important to consider um, when we're talking about finances and Dr. Quisney Barry mentioned about supplemental pieces, all of that comes into play as well. So I love your questions as well. And I'm looking to our chair as we are kind of rolling into the next steps of the agenda, Lori, when we need to have a conversation about where is it we want to go um, with this committee moving forward as well. And I assure, and sorry to just jump in, I assure you guys, I am writing down what you guys are asking and what you guys are requesting. So um, going forward, uh, we will definitely discuss the rubric criteria. I also um, wanted to get you guys thoughts on um, revising the mission statement. But that's something we can just pick up um, as we go forward. But the um, rubric criteria seems to be the biggest one. So I'm just writing it down. So just letting you guys know that. Yes, and we're happy happy to help and we'll meet with you on that. So the um, so just let us know if you're interested in serving on the um, textbook adoption committee and representing the curriculum advisory committee. I believe our first, um, our next meeting is the same day as um, our next meeting, the, the, um, the textbook adoption committee meeting, I believe is also October 25th, but it's earlier in the day. So if you'll just let us know sometime in the next couple of weeks, um, if you're willing to serve on that textbook adoption committee, and then we will work with um, Melvin and Brian and Ms. Giovanelli to generate these topics on the next agenda as well. All good discussion. So, um, Lauren, one of the, I'm Lauren, sorry, I'm sorry. If, uh, if they decide tomorrow they want to serve on the committee, you just want them to email. How, what's the, how would you like them to submit their names? Yeah, if you could just email um, Helen or any Bethany, Candace, or I, any of us, we'll make sure that we get you all of the necessary information. Okay, and, and, and sorry, Lori or Dr. Spiro, uh, just some housekeeping. Uh, are, are me and Melvin not allowed to email? We, we could communicate through you. Is that, um, I just want to keep ourselves out of trouble here. So, um, so last year we were told that when we meet to do the agenda, um, the two of you and the board can't be there at the same time. So Melvin can meet with Ms. Giovanelli and then we can meet with you to discuss it and see if there's anything you want to add. It gets a little complicated. Okay, okay fair enough. Question. Just one more, just one more thing, because 
I'm elementary. And if you asked me to serve on the high school algebra math, I think I would break <laughs> into hives. So <laughs> if when you email us, you say which, which uh, math you're comfortable with, you don't have to be, specific, you know, just elementary or, or secondary. Or middle or high too. We, we have three there groups. <laughs> and um, before, Lori, before you guys change topics, just so you guys have this. So when we do textbook adoption, if you're interested, I know Lori mentioned October 25th, that's our next big one, but we have two evening trainings that if you're going to serve and represent the committee, October 19th and October 20th are five to seven. So in order to know the process and go through those pieces, you would want to be available on those nights. So October 19th and October 20th, they are five to 7 p.m. And that's regardless of if you would like to sit on algebra and do high school things that make me happy or sit on elementary. So either of those pieces, it's the same for for K-12. And uh, we also recorded uh, the best standards training and we could send that to you as well so that we could get you acclimated to the new standards so that you'll know what to be reviewing. Um, one of the things that, um, that we sent you a link to early on was the Parents Bill of Rights and Friday is the last day for you to, um, for you to uh, make comments, and they ask that the comments be made directly to Mr. Pui Bruno, um, the board attorney, um, and or Mary uh, Reader, her secretary. We'll be sure to get you the names and the email addresses um, and the form for that. But is there any questions that you have about that that we can answer before we close? Laura, I wanted just I, I just wanted to show the group. So there's an ongoing feedback form. So. Uh, Candace or Bethany, who's ever driving, if you can go to the main school webpage, I know that uh, the main part of it, so I want to show them how to get here. Uh, so we, I know that we sent out in our in our minutes the parents' rights bill, which is a big bill that has a lot of information for parents on there. And what we have done is we've created a web page um, that has this bill on here. So what we're showing on the screen here is the front landing page from the school district of Lee County. And you'll see right here in the front, it says Parents Bill of Rights. And uh, if you click right on there to say learn more, uh, that'll take you to a web page that has uh, the bill. And if you want to scroll down for me, please. And then within the bill, within the language of the bill, are various links. You can keep scrolling down. Are various live links, um, whether it's not whether it's how to or whether it's district policy that correlates directly with the parent rights bill. Um, and so you can see how lengthy this bill is. And then at the very bottom of this web page is an opportunity, and you can see that these are all live links. Keep on going all the way down. So these are all right there. So then- I was after, trying not to make everybody dizzy. You know how when you- That's all right, like Bethany. That. <laughs> I had to do with driving. So I was trying to make eye contact with one of you. Thank you. So, uh, after you get a chance to look at the bill and then look at the links that are there, um, they are asking for feedback. And what they're asking for is, you know, maybe what's missing, what don't you see, or feedback on the content that is there. So this is such a large bill. Uh, the district wanted to have a location that the bill was spelled out where we had kind of a one-stop shop where you could find policies and procedures pertaining to this bill, but give you an opportunity to give feedback. So though that was sent to you in an email ahead of time, and Lori is correct, they are looking for information on the policy, feedback on the policy is what they're looking for feedback on. The bill itself will have its own webpage, and you can always give comments. There's no limitation on that. We're going to have that comment link live the entire time that the page is here. So this page is live and ever-changing. So as we get feedback, uh, we will add documents to it as well. Uh, whatever our community feels is appropriate. And we work with our attorney, Dupay Bruno. We met earlier on that uh, to provide that insight. So I just wanted to share that with you uh, because we think it's very important for our community members, especially those of you that have children, to make sure that you know this parent rights bill is out there. And uh, we want to give you the opportunity and time to review all that and then give your feedback. So thank you, Laura. I know we're running short on time, but I want to make sure I share that. So thank you. Thank you. And then Melvin, typically um, 
we ask our board if there are any topics that she would like for us to explore throughout the year, but I see that everyone is interested in the rubric. And so I, mm -hmm. I believe we have enough to create the agenda for next month, unless Ms. Giovanelli has something that is very urgent for us to review um, besides that. Anything, Ms. Giovanelli? Oh, she gave the thumbs up. She's thumbs good to up. go. I'm not, I can't see gallery, sorry. Okay. And, and Lori, so, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes. Just real quick, is there anybody that has anything, any other item that they want to consider or talking about at the next meeting? Um, if you have something that is interest of interest, just let me know. Um, I don't know if you guys need me to share my email or not, but just um, is there anything you guys want to discuss for the next meeting that we haven't covered? Would would the parents' bill of rights be outside the scope of this uh, curriculum committee once it's finalized the policy? Because I do have some questions on this. I thought we'd have a little more time on. I think I saw ten minutes on the agenda, but um, I mean we're 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 out of time, so that's fine. But I just wasn't sure if this could be revisited at a later date. Yeah, later, and, and if it's something the group wants to talk about for the parents' bill of rights, because that um that is ever changing that document like i said earlier but that would be typically something that would go with our district advisory because this is more of a curriculum okay. but but, if, but i would say but if the group would like to have further conversation about that down the road i think that's something we could decide as you know as a committee that this is something that we would like to have on there actually um to add on to what brian's saying this is something that does affect curriculum because one of the things that it emphasized is the parents right to opt out of certain curriculum and teachings and i think that that's something that we've lacked as a district in the past that communication and that clarity the information going to the parents and understanding when it would be in the classroom um and their ability to opt out of those things. And that does apply to the Parents' Bill of Rights. So maybe we should revisit the way that it applies to the curriculum specifically. Okay. You took, so Melvin, you, there you go. There's another, top, there's another topic for you to consider took, as we're making a future agenda. You took the words out of my mouth. I just want to say one more thing. Uh, lines 217 and 218 talk about the right to inspect instructional materials. Mm -hmm. So I would just like more clarification on the policy and how that uh, the process, once it's all finalized. Sure. So, but I hear what, so what I think I'm hearing from Brian and Daniela were definitely specifically in the parent bill of rights around the curriculum specific issues about opting out of certain curriculum and inspection of materials, things of that nature. So that definitely is something for future agenda, Melvin. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Spiro. And uh, it, that uh, the parent bill of rights, it can be, it's always amendable, correct? The documents we put on there is that's us as a district. We've created that webpage to try to be very uh, open with our community and the documents that we have. So if there are pieces that we need to add, modify, we can't modify the language of the Parents' Bill of Rights, but the information that we attach to it to help support okay. it, something that we direct have a direct impact with. Okay, good. I have a we question right. about the Parent Bill of Rights. It looks like it's a house bill. So this is something that's through the legislation. So your website that you show is to kind of provide like a, walkthrough of how the district policies align with the parent bill of rights it is uh to take okay. that that is to take the parent bill of rights itself put it on the web page with the language in the bill and then provide um district supported documents to indicate how the district is supporting each component of mm -hmm. the bill so it's very very inclusive mm -hmm. Which is why I wanted to point out because I wanted to give everybody an opportunity to look at that, and, and one, so I tried to point. I wanted to point everybody to that web page so they could see it, get a chance to spend some time looking through it, see what those uh, documents are, get feedback if needed. And then Melvin, I, like I said, it sounds like it's another good topic because it seems to be some interest here on that as well. Okay. Has it been shared on social media at all about the Parent Bill of Rights and kind of like this crosswalk of? how the district policies align with the parent bill of rights? Because I'm just being honest, most people don't go to the district website for everything, or is it also showing on individual school websites as well? Like if your kid goes to Fort Myers High School, would it be a banner on their page or some link in that way to it? So there was, there's going to be, this is, this is brand new. We just shared it with the board last week. You're the first advisory uh, to really see the webpage itself. 
And yes, it'll be pushed out so that all school web pages will all school web pages will have it as well. Uh, Irma Lancaster is our director of communications. Will be that's why you see it on our landing page. She's going to start doing a different push and getting that out in our community. And I and I agree with you. Just having people go to our district web page um, is a really narrow scope of how to communicate. So those were all the type of mediums like social media uh, that we will be using as we move this forward. Ms. Giovanelli. Oh, sorry, Ms. Harris to finish. Oh, no, I was saying thank you. Uh, Ms. Giovanelli, can you bring this up as part of the curriculum advisory feedback to the board and your good of the order to go over that the page is now live and looking for the parent interaction, especially since you always touch on the transparency with the district? Well, I, and actually, we did talk about that. That was one thing we wanted to make sure that all the the, you know, the websites that each school has it and the information is out there and that it's like when you pull up the website that it would be there in the forefront, one of something they could see right away. So we actually had that conversation already, but I will keep reiterating it. Absolutely. I feel like the content was missing, like your or the intent essentially of what the interaction was, the difference between how um, Dr. Spiro explains it, where it's not just the house bill, it's how the school is applying its policies to the house bill. I think that was that missing piece to look for how okay. the public wants to interact or feels about the school policy regarding those changes. So that's why I'm asking to reiterate it, but thank you. Okay, so yeah, so you're saying that you want parents to understand that this is, that you don't think it was conveyed at the time of the meeting that it's the actual parents, it's, it, it's to implement how we're uh, implementing the Bill of Rights for the parents and it, within the schools. Is that what you're saying? It wasn't conveyed that way? Yes, I did. Well, okay. I will say I didn't understand it in that direction. And okay. I don't, I, I think it. that was a missing piece for me to hear that dialogue right there. So I feel like that would be helpful to reiterate. Okay, thank you. And there's a lot to them. So there's a lot to this, Melvin, at the Parents Bill of Rights too. Um, so it would definitely be, I would recommend if that's something we wanna do as a meeting, I would like to recommend that one as a standalone uh, meeting and not mixed in with another one. That way we have enough time to walk through um, as a future meeting. Okay. And Dr. Spiro, we, we do have to brief this again, at, correct? So that's yes, when you can hit on it then, if you don't mind. Yes, ma'am. And, and I'll help with that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Melvin, okay. back to your question, I would like to confirm, um, you did mention the uh, addressing the um, mission statement as an agenda item, correct? Uh, yeah, I want to just spend a couple of a uh, few minutes on uh, just revising it. It does seem a little bit too wordy, and I want to make sure that everybody's input um, is heard um, as we move forward to um, make it less wordy but more uh, clear for um, for public view. I agree. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So. Um... Melvin, I'm gonna let you take this over. So if you'll just call for good of the order and then ask if um, anyone wants to move to adjourn the meeting and then I'm gonna let you close it out and thank you. And then we'll be back in touch for a plan meeting. Okay, um, well, first and foremost, um, I'm gonna call for the good of the order. Um, the only thing that I'll add, I'll speak is, um, I'm you know, thankful that you guys uh, selected myself and Brian to um, lead this committee. And um, of course, nobody in here is um, more expertise than the next person. So um, everybody's ideas are welcome and everybody's voice will be heard. So is there anyone else who has anything for the good of the order? If not, I would like to call this meeting to an adjournment. And um, is there anyone who seconds? I second that. <laughs> All right. Is this where I say meeting adjourned? <laughs> meeting adjourned. So thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks, everyone. You too. Thank you very much. Thank you.